Lord Jesus taught us to pray. He said, pray like this. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Amen. Now listen, when you pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, do you understand what you're praying? Because I want you to, I, I never really thought about this until I was challenged about my beliefs on God's healing. And we're actually going to be doing a healing Sunday school in June. Um, and I think it's even on the church app. So if you're interested in learning about what the Bible says about healing and, and, and biblical approaches to praying for healing. Um, I really encourage you to, to sign up for that. But one of the things that really challenged me was to think about what is God's will in heaven? Is God's will in heaven for you to be depressed? Is God's will in heaven for you to be sick? Is God's will in heaven for you to be desperate and not understanding and, 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 and wondering, how am I going to get food? How am I gonna... God's will is not that at God's will in heaven is perfection. Therefore, when we pray, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So say, Lord, I want to have everything that you have for me. And so, Lord, I want to be everything you want me to be. Because I know I'm not going to sit in heaven. Therefore, Therefore, help me to be somebody who has to sit down. And, and you know, know I just want to do what you want me to do because in heaven, if you tell me to do something, I'm going to do it without questioning. So would you just take that away from my life where I want to question you? Your, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Kids, you can be dismissed this morning. Thank you for praying with us, children. We have a great children's church. The rest of us are going to turn to Revelation 15, 1 through 8. Revelation 15, 1 through 8, which is the entirety of Revelation 15. And then it says, we're just going to preach chapter by chapter now. I said, I don't know, man, whatever the Lord has for us. Uh, Revelation 15 is a lot shorter than 14, um, but it has one overarching theme. I'll see if you catch it. Revelation 15, starting at verse 1. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing. Seven, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last, for with them the wrath of God is finished. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire, and also those who had conquered the beast and the image and the number of its name, standing beside the sea of glass with the hearts of God in their hands. And they sing, and they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of nations, who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name, for you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. After this I looked at the sanctuary of the tents of witnesses in heaven were opened. And out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with the seven plagues. And out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with the seven plagues, clothed with pure white linen, with golden sashes around their chests. And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls of the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. And the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the, glory, from the glory of God and from his power, and no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. Praise God. Y'all may be seated. See if my nose decided to come back. Otherwise, we're just waiting today. Glory to God. So we're now being introduced to the final outpouring of God's wrath. And um, what we've seen is we've seen, uh, first we see the, the seven seals that are broken. And then inside the seventh seal is the seven trumpets. And within the seventh trumpet are now the seven bowls of God's wrath. Seven, seven, seven. Seven out, three, three times seven outpourings of God's wrath. And we're about to be given, uh, in the next chapter, in chapter 16, we're about to be given a, a breakdown of what these seven bowls of God's wrath looks like. 
And then we're going to see the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're going to see New Jerusalem. We're going to see the beast conquered. We're going to see the final battle. We're going to see all this goodness happen uh, where God just, uh, just conquers, 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 conquers. Uh, and so after the seven after the seven bowls of God's wrath that we talk about um, in the next upcoming weeks, um, after we get through those, we're done with the outpouring of God's wrath. Glory to God. And then it's just victory, victory, victory. Victory for the Lamb, victory for the saints, victory for the Spirit, victory for God, the Father. So we have these seven bowls of God's wrath. Sometimes, depending on your translation, it might be called seven vials of God's wrath. And we're told in verse 15, this is the end of the outpouring of God's wrath. Or verse 1 of chapter 15. He says, Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and amazing, seven angels with seven plagues, which are the last. For with them the wrath of God is finished. Y'all, we have almost made it through the hardest parts of Revelation. We're almost there. Glory to God. It's all down here on the hill from here. So that's fairly uh, relieving to learn that um, after this, after these next three chapters or so, this chapter and the following two chapters, uh, we're, we're going to get to see victory. Uh, but I, I want to show you something about this chapter that I find very unique, and I didn't even catch it the first time I read. And it depends on how your Bible um, kind of uh, writes the translation, but this can be easy to miss, that this chapter seems like it's this preparatory chapter for the opening of these, these veils and the outpouring of these bowls. And it's really easy to focus on the wrath of God. And it was these seven bowls, the wrath is finished, and the smoke comes, and this thing, and the other thing. But half of this chapter is about worship and praise. And it's so easy to read and just miss that. But half of this chapter, and I actually did a word count, and half of the words in this chapter are about worshiping and praising God in the midst of all of this that is happening. So I think what I would like to focus on today is that song. The song is the saints of God who are worshiping and praising their holy and just king. Father, I pray over this message and I pray that as we uh, take a break here from your wrath and we talk about praising you and worshiping you, Lord, that you would change our hearts even more, that you would draw us closer, even closer still, that we would leave this place with a greater desire to worship and praise you, with a better understanding of who you are as the victor, as the conqueror, as the winner. Lord, help us to have a life of worship, that we worship and praise you in spirit and truth everywhere we go. In Jesus' name we pray. So this morning what I want to talk about is the song of victory. You bring up that title slide. The song of victory. Because really that's a, that's a major theme here in chapter 15. And it's not the theme of chapter 15. It's certainly a major theme in chapter 15. It is the song of victory. We're going to have plenty of time to talk about the wrath of God as we go through the seven bowls of God's wrath. But today we're going to talk only about singing victory. Revelation 15, 2 through 4. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire. And those who had offered the beast and its image and the number of its name standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God on their hands. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of nations, who will not fear. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you. For you are righteous, and your righteous acts have been revealed. Point one this morning, God always wins. God always wins. Nothing but dumb. No else. Always the victor. God always wins. Wins. Yeah. Not sometimes, yeah. not most of the time, yeah. not yeah, yeah. probably, but what about? No, no God, God always wins. wins. Yeah. Revelation 15, 2, I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire, and also those who had conquered the beast, and the image of the number of its name standing beside the sea of glass with hearts in their hands. 
the peace, y'all. We talked about the two peace. We talked about the Antichrist, the prophet, we listed up the Antichrist. We talked about Satan. Y'all, they get conquered. They lose. They get the L. God gets the W. God gets the victory. We're talking about this in Bible in 90 days, uh, about Revelation, and how people are afraid of Revelation. I'm like, that's because they don't understand that it's a book about victory. It's a book about the win. Oh, I think it was uh, Deacon Stephanie, who was like, my favorite book is Revelation. And people look at me, and they're like, that's so strange. How could your favorite book be Revelation? And I'm like, yeah, the Revelation, it's the story of God winning once and for all. But just think of it, okay, a little package example, okay? Bear with me, Bears fans, and, uh, and, and Vikings fans. Just think about those plays where there's two seconds left on the clock. And the Packers are down by five. And Aaron Rodgers is on like the 45 yard line, and he just throws that ball. Right? And you can see that. And some receiver just jumps out of a crowd of defenders and pulls it down and wins the game. Is that not the moment when you're most excited in the football game? Is that not the moment when you go crazy? And you're like, who am I just watch? Right? And people look at Revelation and they're like, oh, it's so scary. I'm like, no, man, I gotta win. This is the moment. afraid of this. We should be like, yo, read Revelation. Look at what my God does. Yeah, I know you feel the persecution when you look at all what's going on with Russia and Ukraine and these people are being hurt, these people are being killed, and you know what's going on? Nigeria and Belarus and all of these places. But listen, God wins. That's the end of the story. The beast will be conquered. Revelation 15.2 says those who conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name. Now, if you'll remember in Revelation 14, there was this verse that said, listen, blessed are those who die from this point forward. Blessed are those who die from this point forward. Because here in Revelation 15, we're probably not talking about post-rapture. We're not talking about all of the saints of God. We're talking about those saints of God who were martyred or starved to death because they refused to get the mark of the beast. So they've died. And God has brought them up. They've got a special blessing, a special place. They're given harps. They're surrounding God because they refuse to bow down to the beast and his number. And it says about them, they conquered. They conquered the beast. They won. So there's a special place in heaven for end time martyrs. If, by God's grace, we are allowed to see the end times, it's a good thing. And if, you, by God's grace, you are allowed to die for your faith, it's a good thing. And if, by God's grace, you're allowed to starve to death because no one will sell you food, because you refuse the mark of the beast, it is a good thing. There's a special place in heaven for these end time martyrs. You see, the beast, the beast probably thought he won, didn't he? Satan probably thought he had the victory. When all of these saints died, Satan's sitting back thinking, I finally did it. I got rid of all the Christians. I killed them off. They're done. They refused the mark, and now they're dead. The beast is sitting back happy. No more churches. No more worship. No more praise. No more stubborn Christians making converts in the streets and going from house to house. None of that. They're finally dead. The beast had thought he was wrong. Because he had killed all of the Christians. But the beast was wrong. Because death is not the end. Someone needs to let Satan know you can't win the game at halftime. You don't win the marathon by being the first to, cro to cross the 13th mile. It's the team with the highest score at the end of the game that wins. It's the runner who crosses the finish line at the end of the race, at the 26.2 mile that wins, right? Since I gave a Packers example, here's a Seahawks example, glory to God. God's chosen and favored team. I was watching the Seahawks game with, uh, against the Packers with Pastor Dick some eight years ago, the year that the Seahawks won the Super Bowl. And I don't know if you remember, but the Seahawks were down 13 to 17 at halftime. And all of the Seahawks fans were leaving the stadium because it was over. Y'all, the Seahawks won. Didn't matter what happened at halftime. Matters at the end of the game. And death ain't the end. 
probably get more out of the Packers examples than the Seahawks examples. Seahawks examples, you're all like, yeah, I don't remember this. I turned the TV off. Satan thought he had won when he, put cross, when he put Christ on the cross, but death is not the end. The beast will think that he wins when he kills all the saints, but death is not the end. In the end, Jesus rose again, and in the end, the saints will rise again. In the end, God wins. God always wins. 1 Corinthians 15, 55 through 58. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that the labor you do for the Lord is not in vain. I love that verse because first it gives us that comfort, right? There's no, there's no sting in death. That doesn't have victory. Jesus has the victory. And secondly, because it knows at some point I'm going to die, but my labor is not in vain. Because my life is eternal, and the fruits of my labor that are eternal will continue on. Now, there's some things I do in life that are in vain. God's not going to care 10,000 years from now that I was the 50th best Halo 3 player when I was 18 years old. No one's going to, he's not going to care. God's not going to care about my doctoral thesis if I ever go and get my doctorate. But what God will care about is that people were led to Christ under this ministry. What God will care about is that people were worshipped. God will care about that people were cared for and loved. And every time that you lead someone to Christ, that you invite someone to church, that you worship him, that you fellowship, that you show the love of Christ through good works and charity, you are planting eternal fruits. And in the end, God gets the victory. Yeah, you're going to die, but God gets the victory. Saints, y'all need to understand this. I know I'm hitting it a lot, but I just want you to go away with victory this morning. Now, last, last week we did a lot of teaching, and we talked about the rapture, and there wasn't a lot of application. So today, man, you're just getting the good stuff. God wins. Someone say God wins. God wins. All he does is win. All he has is W's. No L's, no ties, just W's. He is undefeated. All God does is wins. And his wins are spectacular. They are wonderful. They are awesome. They are beautiful. All God does is win. Over your life, God wins. Over your finances, God wins. Over your health, God wins. Over your heartache, God wins. In your mourning, God wins. In your struggles, God wins. In your battles, God wins. Against your flesh, God wins. Against your enemies, God wins. Against sin, God wins. Against hordes of demons, God wins. Against the beast in Revelation, God wins. And certainly against the devil, God wins. God always wins. Now, I'm not saying you always win. Because you have to be on God's side. But I am saying God always wins. So it behooves you to always be on God's team. To always be on God's side. And even when it doesn't look like God's going to win, we know from the abundance of Scripture that God wins. In a few weeks, we're going to celebrate the Passover. We do it every year as God commanded. And why does God want us to remember the Passover? Because it's the story of God winning. The story of God freeing his people from slavery in Egypt. Not only that, but it prophetically preaches of when God will win on the cross. And not only that, but maybe you didn't realize this, but Passover prophetically preaches of when God will win again over the beast. Even when it looked like Pharaoh wasn't going to let the people go, God won. Even when it looked like Pharaoh was only going to release the men, God won. Even when the Israelites' backs were to the Red Sea and the Pharaoh's army with all of their chariots and horses and warriors were closing in, God won. It looked like there was no escape. It looked like death was certain. It looked like defeat was coming, but God won. God split the Red Sea so the Israelites could cross on dry ground. And when Pharaoh's armies and chariots tried to chase after them, God had the sea swallowed them up because God doesn't lose. God wins. So what are we supposed to do when God wins? Well, when God wins, we have a biblical response, and that is to praise and worship him. We ought to write new songs. We ought to sing old songs. We ought to play new music. We ought to play old music. We ought to use instruments. We ought to sing. We ought to dance. We ought to cheer. We ought to praise. We ought to worship. 
That's exactly what Moses did, and it's exactly what we see here happening in Revelation chapter 15. We see the praise of the saints who have conquered the Lamb. We see the praise of God's people because God has won. So point two this morning, when God wins, worship and praise Him. Revelation 15, 2 through 3. And I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name standing beside the sea of glass with harps of gods in their hands. You know, there are whole denominations that believe that you should not use instruments to praise God. And they say, well, there's no instruments in the New Testament. I'm like, I guess your Bible ended before Revelation, because it says right there they got harps in their hand. That's a stringed instrument, man. With the harps of God in their hand. And they sing the song of Moses, the servants of God, and the song of, lamb, of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. You see that? They sang a song. And you know what? It wasn't even a new song. Did you catch that? Sometimes there's new songs, and God loves a new song. Sing a new song unto the Lord. That's a good thing. But God loves an old song, too. God loves an old song, too. And, and this, this particular time, this was an old song. What song was it? It was the song that Moses sang after God parted the Red Sea for them, then closed it up over Pharaoh's army. It says that right in verse 3. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb saying, great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Look at Exodus 15, 1 through 2. Moses has just led his people through the Red Sea. The Red Sea was miraculously parted. The sand wasn't even wet. They passed through on dry ground. They got through the other side, and, and Pharaoh said, well, if they could do it, we could do it. They started going through on the dry ground. The ocean closed in and crushed Pharaoh's army. And so now here is, here is Moses with God's people on the other end. And they've seen this miraculous victory. Time and time again they see God's victory. But now they see this massive victory and they say, we need to sing a song to God. And so he sang this song, Moses 15, or Exodus 15, 1 through 2. Written by Moses. Exodus 15, 1 through 2. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. See, the Passover is prophetic, not just about the lamb conquering sin on the cross, but also about the lamb conquering the devil and the beast and all of his minions. I love all these songs that we sing uh, about, the, about the Lion of Judah. Who is worthy to open the scroll? We preached about that. How, how Jesus was the only one. The Lamb was the only one who was found able to open the scroll, to bring in the end times, to bring everything to completion. And it's in that, that, that word, the Lamb, it's not like God just picked any old animal. He could have said, he could have said lemur. Right? Lemurs are cute. Why couldn't it have been a lemur? Could have been a sloth. I don't know. Sloths are cute. They're a little slow, but they're adorable. Right? Could have been a cat or a bear. Why is it a lamb? Because God said in Egypt to his people, you need to find a pure and spotless lamb and you need to slaughter it to cover your house with its blood so that the, that the angel of death will pass over your house and not take your firstborn son. It was prophetic. Not just of what Jesus did on the cross, but what Jesus does again when he comes back on the clouds. When he comes back on the white horse. When he comes and reconquers. He is once again called the Lamb. That is why in Revelation 15 it's not just called the Song of Moses, but it's the Song of Moses and the Lamb. So again, I implore you, get signed up for Passover. And let Passover be ingrained into your family tradition. We do so much traditionally. That has no eternal value. Get some eternal traditions. Moses said, I will sing to the Lord for he triumphed gloriously. Someone say, glorious triumph. Glorious triumph. Come on, glorious triumph. glorious triumph. It wasn't just any old triumph. It wasn't just any old victory. It was 
glorious triumph. It was awesome victory. When God delivered his people from Egypt by the blood of the Passover lamb, glorious triumph. When God delivered his people by the blood of the spotless lamb, Jesus Christ, glorious triumph. When God overthrows the beast and his minions and casts Satan into hell, glorious triumph. And because of that glorious triumph, we ought to sing. Exodus 15, 2, the Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. We as Christians need a bit more of some stuff in our life. We need more Bible, for sure. That's evidenced by the state of our nation. We need to open our Bible, read it, and do what it says, not just on Sundays, but every day. Y'all know I'm passionate about that. I think we could certainly do with some more prayer. Most prayer, uh, more prayer I mean, more prayer for the nations, more prayer for God's glory, more prayers of thanksgiving, more prayers for miracles, more prayers for victory. One of the things we're going to do to have more, more prayer in our church's life is the last Wednesday of every month, starting this Wednesday, is instead of having a, a, a sermon, we're just going to have worship and prayer, and we're just going to allow the Spirit to prophetically move. Um, so starting this Wednesday, we're going we're gonna to dive into uh, just worship and prayer night um, for the last Wednesday of the month. Because I just think we need more of it in our lives. And I really think that the American Christian is quite starved of praise and worship. We could do with a good deal more of praise and worship. Colossians 3 and 16 let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Psalm 95, 1 through 3. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with the songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and the King above all gods. Psalm 100, verse 1 through 3. And side note, I love that God doesn't deny that there are other worshipers. He understands people worship Buddha and Muhammad and they worship their ancestors or they worship Karishnu and all of these other gods. God understands those things. But God says those gods, those false gods that people have made up, those carved images, yeah, they've got these false gods. They're nothing compared to me. I'm their king too. Love that. Psalm 100, 1 through 2, a psalm for giving thanks. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Psalm 100, verse 4, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name. Psalm 150, 1 through 6, praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellence, greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and heart. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with loud crashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Listen to me, church. If all you do is praise God on Sundays, are you any better than the worshipers of, of, of Allah, who Allah doesn't even exist? They get out there and they worship a God who doesn't exist every Sunday. Every week they go out. So I think they do it on Friday. I don't know. I'm not Muslim. I'm not a biologist. I don't know what time they, they, they worship. Um, I'm sorry. Political shot. Okay. We have these, we have these people who, who worship carved images. They can't speak. They can't do. They can't act. All they do is lose. And they've got altars in their house so they can worship every day. Yo, we serve the one and true only living God who is alive, who is active, who wins, who has the victory. Don't you think we could worship him a little more than an hour and a half once a week? Some Christians can't even do it that much. If it is true that when God wins, we should praise him, and if it is true that all God does is win, then it must certainly be true that all we should do is worship Him and glorify Him and praise Him. We should be worshiping and praising always. Hebrews 13, verse 15. 
Through him, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is, the fruit of our lips that acknowledge his name. Does, does, does that mean that we just ignore our situation? No, we can acknowledge our situation. We can acknowledge that the situation is dire. I think about the Ukrainian Christians as bombs are dropping over their cities, as their churches are being blown up, as they're fleeing for their lives. And I think about the churches that say, you know, we're still going to worship. Yes. They still worship and they still praise and they still give thanks. And then after worshiping and praying and giving thanks, then they say, Lord, would you protect us? Lord, would you make the bombs fail? Lord, would you make the tanks run out of gas? Lord, would you confuse the armies? Because they're not denying their situation. They're just saying, man, this is what we do as Christians. We praise. I love that song. This is how I fight my battles. God says, send the Levites out first. Send the worship team out. As the enemies are getting their bows ready and their catapults ready and their chariots ready and they're ready to come and charge after you, don't send out the, 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 the soldiers. Don't send out your armies. Send out the Levites. Let them hear some worship and praise. And then watch what I do. Who say, well, God, that doesn't seem very wise. The Levites, they're not very good at fighting. What are they going to do? Hit someone over the head with their trumpet? Like what? You're going to send out the weakest people first? No, no, no. God's ways are not our ways. His ways are better than our ways. Man, you send the Levites out. They start singing. They start praising. The enemy thinks, look at those idiots. They sent out their worship team. They should have sent out their best soldiers. And so they start charging in. And the Levites are worshiping. And you're wondering, what's God going to do? And then hailstorms start coming down. And the fire starts raining down. And you're just sitting there worshiping God and being like, hey, you all put your swords away. We don't need them today. God's got this. God's taking care of it. Because we should be worshiping and praising God always because all God does is win. Even when it looks like we're outnumbered, all God does is win. Love those, those verses in the Old Testament. Open their eyes. Let them see that those who are with us are more than those who are against us. See, sometimes we don't even see it. But we can know it. You don't have to see it to know it. Right? All God does is win. It's not enough to sing just on Sunday mornings and Wednesday evenings. All God does is win. He doesn't just win on Sunday mornings and Wednesday evenings. All God does is win. He's always winning. So I want to give you some application this morning. I want to challenge you in the way that you walk your life out. I'm going to challenge you with something, and this is a real challenge. I really want to encourage you in this. I really want to press on you in this that I think will really help change your spiritual life. It changed my spiritual life when I took this up when I was about 17 years old. I had been saved for about a year, year and a half, and God began to change things in my life. And he's challenging me again and afresh. He's beginning to change things even more in my life. I want these things to change in your life too. Most of you listen to music often. Be it in the car, in the shower, while doing chores, while working out, whatever. So here is what I'm asking of you today. Set aside today that you're done listening to secular music. I know it may not be what some of you want to hear. Set aside today that you are done listening to secular music. No more classic rock, no more jazz, no more oldies. No more top 40s, no more indie emo, blah. Whatever you listen to that's not Christ-centered, I challenge you to replace that with Christian music. But not just any Christian music. With worship and praise music. I'm not talking about Jesus take the wheel. Not that there's anything wrong with Christian music. I praise God for Christian music. But there's a difference between Christian music and worship music. Between Christian music that is music sung by a Christian about Christian things and worship music, right? I love, I love Andy Minio, but Andy Minio rarely worships God. He's a Christian. He's, he raps about being a Christian. He's really fun to listen to. He's very talented. I, I, I prefer rap music. I don't know what y'all listen to. Probably indie black music. But I, God's challenged me. And he's like, you know, you listen to a lot of Andy Minio. How about you listen to a little bit more worship? How about a little bit more praise? So I challenge you with this. And, and I don't challenge it as a, as a law, like not as a, not as a legalism thing, not as a holier-than-thou thing, not as a I want, a, I want us to be all those prudes who are like, all we do is go to church and we wear long denim dresses if we're women, and if we're men, we always wear a suit, and we don't leave the house unless we're wearing a suit. I'm not talking about that kind of vain 
religion. All right? I'm not saying that, that God is going to send you to H-E double hockey sticks if you listen to your favorite song from, from the early 2000s or anything like that. Occasionally, I still listen to a secular song here or two. Normally, it's Everything is Awesome from the Lego Movie because it pumps me up. All right? I, I'm a giant child. I don't know why. I love the Lego Movie. So I'm not saying, man, I know there's songs that have, that have changed your life and that, that, that just bring out that, that, that time or that era. And I'm not saying you can't ever listen to that kind of music. Certainly, if it's overtly sinful, stay away from it. All right, don't be going and pumping F the police while you're rolling down the church. Be like, Pastor said, man, this is a song that got me through, man. When the cop's trying to get at me, I'm just going to drop it like it's hot, man. I don't, like, okay, maybe not that. Okay, all right. Y'all didn't know I was cool. I got a past, I got a testimony. I'm not, I'm not saying, I'm not saying legalistically. I'm saying, man, what if 99.99% of music that I listen to was just worship? What if just when I'm in the car, and I just turn on some, some worship, I just turn on some, some, some of the upper room or elevation or, or uh, um, Chandler Moore, man, I love listening to Chandler Moore worship and worshiping with him. And, and, and maybe you're old and you like listening to, to, to Gaithers or whatever. I like listening to the Gaithers. I feel like, I'm, you ain't, I know you're not old. You're the old soul. I'm with you. <laughs> I love, man, the Gaithers can bring it, okay? All right. I listen to, I, I listen to some George Beverly Shea. All right, how great our God on the vinyl, whatever it is. They didn't have CDs back then. Whatever it is, y'all. I'm getting distracted. I got to bring it back in. Whatever kind of worship you enjoy, whatever kind of worship you like to listen to, man, just change your playlist. Change your CDs. Just like, and, I'm, and I'm really encouraging you because you will notice a closeness with God that you've never noticed before. If just, instead of listening to that podcast that you love to listen to, if you just turn on some worship and just, just begin to sing. Be crazy in your car. Some of y'all afraid to be crazy in church. At least be crazy in your car. God could see you there. Let, man, let worship just be a part of your life. Let it be a part of who you are. Let it be ingrained into your person. Watch how God draws near to you. I want you to be close to God. I want to serve a church where we are all close to God, where we all have that experience. And I don't want to serve a valley of dry bones. I want to serve a living army, ready and active and ready to do what only God can do. I want you to be close to God, and I want God to be close to you. And if you would praise God as a lifestyle, God would inhabit you as a lifestyle. Psalm 22, verse 3. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabits the praises of Israel. God inhabits the praises of Israel. In other words, God inhabits the praises of his people. Those whom he has chosen, those whom he has called by his name. The Bible says that as Christians, we are a part of Israel. We are grafted into the vine. We are, we are sealed in the covenant by the circumcision of our heart. We are heirs to Abraham's promises. All of that means that we are a part of Israel. And God inhabits the praises of Israel. God inhabits the praises of his people. Now what does that mean, Pastor? I thought that God was, was omnipresent. I thought that God was everywhere, and God certainly is everywhere. Not only is God everywhere, but he lives inside of you and inside of your heart. But there is a difference between God's omnipresence and God's manifest presence. God's manifest presence is what he says, not only am I there, but I want to be there, I want to be there in, in a real and thick and tangible way. I want you to feel me and know that I'm sitting in that car with you. I want you to know that I'm right there, that I'm active in your life, that I'm readily available. I want to be close to you as you are close to me. And God does that when we worship and praise him. And if you would have a spirit of worship and praise in your life, church, you would have a manifest presence where you are going. At work, you could have the manifest presence of God. In your car, you could have the manifest presence of God. In the gym, you can have the manifest presence of God. Why? Because he inhabits the praises of his people. He wants to be there while you're singing to him, y'all. He wants to be a part of that. God loves it. There's a song that I have a that I have a slight issue with. Yeah. 
This song suggests that on the cross, God thought of you above all. Thought of me above all. Well, he certainly was thinking of me and he certainly was thinking of you. But he wasn't thinking of us above all. He was thinking about the glory of the Father above all. Why? Because God loves to be with his people. God saved you not because you were a pretty cool, all right, far out kind of dude. Right? God saved you because he wants to be with you. He wants you to be with him. Yes, it was loving. Yes, it was merciful. Yes, it was kind. But at the end, it was his will because he loves to be with his people. The cross made a way for God to be with his people. And when we praise him and when we worship him and when we say, Lord, all you do is win. And I want everybody to know that I serve a victorious God. God shows up and says, that's right. Keep saying it. I want to be close to him. So I praise him in every area of my life. Because I want him to inhabit every area of my life. If you would take this challenge, I promise you, man, it will be life-changing. You, it, it, it really, for me, it, it was almost as thick as when I got saved the first time. Right? You get saved, and you know that joy and that experience as your life changes. If you got saved as an adult or as a teenager, you have that moment where everything changes. And you just have this new relationship with God that you didn't even know you could have a relationship with. And it's so beautiful and it's so powerful and you're full of joy and hope and the spirit of God. Man, when I cut off the secular filth that I was listening to and I replaced it with worship music, all of a sudden I had that kind of experience again. Where all of a sudden I'm even closer to God. And I'm even, I'm even fuller of his joy and of his love and of his peace. And recently, like I said, man, God's been like, hey, how about more worship and praise? So I've been cutting off the Andy Minio. I'll just do it every once in a while when I need to get pumped up. But I'm just like, man, I just want to listen to worship. I just want to praise. I just want to sing. And God has changed these things in my life, and he's become closer than before. I want to conclude with this. Deacon Jamal, would you let the kids' church know we're closing? My daughter has my phone. Um, and worship team, would y'all come up? Praise team, would y'all come up? Revelation 14, 15, 4 through 8. Revelation 15, 4 through 8, our key verses today. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. After this, after this I looked, and the sanctuary of the tent of witness in heaven was opened. And out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with the seven plagues clothed in pure bright linen with golden sashes around their chest. And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels the seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And the sanctuary was filled with smoke and from the glory of God and from his power. And no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. Now there's two, peop two sets of people described in this passage. There's the one set of people who are praising God, and there's the other set of people who are having the wrath of God poured out on their life. Which would you rather be? As for me and my house, we will praise the Lord. We will serve him undoubtedly, but we will also praise and worship him. Before we, before we give you a chance to give your life to Jesus, if you're not a Christian this morning, if you're not born again, you've never given your life to Jesus, we're going to give you an opportunity to do that. But I just want to invite his presence into this place once again. Just let's, can we sing one more praise song? Has God had victory over your life? Has God won in your life? All right, half of y'all. Got all the energy out from before. Everyone's like, woo, now it was like, okay. Time for Taco Bell. Come on, man. Has God had victory in your life? Yeah. Did he not conquer the sin on the cross? Yeah. Has he not overcome? Has he not defeated the devil in your life? Has he, has he not given you good and perfect gifts? Has he not done what he said he was going to do? Has he not fulfilled his promises in your life? Is he not worthy of praise? Would y'all stand up? Come on, let's praise him.